we are very excited to have with us Jason Furman. He is the Aetna Professor of the Practice of Economic Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Department of Economics at Harvard University. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. You all probably know him from his time during eight years as the uh, top economic advisor to President Clinton, including serving as, serving as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. He holds a PhD in economics from Harvard University, and he um, is going to give you what I you know, the, the kind of the intro talk on antitrust that he gives his students. So we are here at MPF, we are providing you all a Harvard education this morning. So Dr. Furman, I wanna thank you for taking the time to come talk with us and I'll turn it over to you. Great, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, the only thing to correct in what you just said is um, that everyone else should call me Jason, but you, you okay. keep calling me Dr. Furman, Chris. Okay, uh, we'll do. Uh, uh, it's great to be with all of you this morning. Um, I should disclose at the outset that I used to get asked which topics I was interested in in economics, and my stock answer was every single one of them, except industrial organization, which is the study of competition and antitrust. Um, I found myself um, doing a lot of work on this topic in my last years in the White House and my years um, since then. I have a perspective on all of it. I'm gonna try to give you sort of the standard way to think about it, introduce you to some of the debates, and then Bill will be coming after me and he'll take you much deeper into where the current um, debates are now. Um, we'd love to start with just a raise of your physical hand. I can see a lot of you. How many of you took um, introductory economics? Okay, most of you did, that's great. Um, in your standard introductory economics class, you spend a lot of time analyzing monopolies, in some cases, oligopolies. And you have the uh, marginal cost curve going down and the marginal revenue curve and they intersect and you go up to get the, uh, down to get the quantity and up to get the price and you do all of that. Um, at the end of all of that, you basically have learned that monopolies have a lower quantity than is optimal and a higher price um, than is optimal. Um, that's an exciting insight, but you probably didn't need to solve all those annoying problems that your professors um, assigned you. Um, I wanted to make sure that my students came away with a sort of richer understanding of the economics of many of the issues that actually are in the news and that we're facing. And so what I'm gonna share with you is the part of the class where I do that, not the part of the class where we do lots of curve shifting and, and problem solving, uh, which you did. In, uh, for those of you that took it, which most of you did, which I'm thrilled to see. So I'm gonna start with competition policy in practice. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, so anything Bill says that contradicts anything I says, he is right and I am wrong. I'm gonna then give you a little bit of what's been going on lately with this whole debate over the increase in concentration, the growth of companies, big companies, bigger and bigger companies, et cetera. And then finally, um, a little bit of time on the digital giants themselves, which is something where I've done a lot of policy work. So first competition policy in practice. Um, this has been an issue since the late 19th century. Um, the robber barons, um, the steel trust, copper, standard oil, which is the Rockefeller one, had just grown so large and were perceived to be the bosses of the Senate dominating what was going on. In response to that, um, the, we started competition policy. The modern economic understanding of competition is that antitrust should protect competition, not competitors. Um, this is a really important distinction. Competition policy is meant to give people more choices, consumers more choices, it's meant to give them hopefully lower prices and better quality. It's not meant to protect the corner store. Um, it's not meant to protect small businesses. It's not meant to protect other businesses that don't like competing. It's meant to make sure there's actually competition. This is an important distinction to have and, and we'll come back to it over and over again. So what do consumers care about? Um, this in, uh, is called the consumer welfare standard. And it's akin to maximizing consumer surplus. For those of you that took economics, that was that shaded area under the demand curve and above the price line. 
Um, it might actually be sur social surplus, which also includes the benefits to producers. In practice, it may have some elements of both. Won't worry ourselves a whole lot about that. Um, but importantly, what it is, is it's about price and quantity. It's about variety, quality, um, and also about innovation, um, which improves future price, variety, and quality. Um, so ultimately, what competition policy is focused on is what benefits consumers. What benefits consumers are all four of these. Now, in practice, this is actually a surprisingly difficult um, thing to do. When something grows, think Walmart, think Amazon, think Facebook, um, it has some pro-competitive benefits. If Walmart comes to a town, all of a sudden, they're cutting prices. They're creating competition. They're creating new choices for consumers. But you know, they may be the only employer in town. Uh, they may be the only one selling things in town because they knock everyone out and it creates um, anti-competitive harms. And so almost every time you have something that's large or something that's growing, you get some combination of things that are actually good for competition coming out of it and harmful. And what the law needs to do is to figure out um, how to balance these two. So um, I want to, by the way, just reiterate, anytime people want to raise your hand, uh, your virtual hand, you can do that. And you know, we'll have time at the end, um, I very much hope as well, for discussions and questions. So at this point, clarifying questions, but don't be shy about clarifying questions. So and in general, what you try to do is avoid two types of errors. You don't want to under enforce. Um, where you're not stopping an anti-competitive harm, but you also don't want to over-enforce. You don't want to take something that was great for consumers and get in the way of it and stop it. And both of these are real errors. And what economics and the law have tried to do is figure out how to minimize errors in both of these directions. And people who are concerned about the competition system tend to think it makes errors too much in one or the other direction. So the US competition policy enforcers, um, most countries, it's just one. In the United States, we have lots. Um, one of them is the Department of Justice, Antitrust Division. Another is the Federal Trade Commission. They have some arcane division of labor where you know one does this hospitals and one does cable companies and one does televisions and none of it makes any sense to me. Maybe Bill understands why, which one, you know, they divide up who does what. Um, uh, there's also the state attorney general do a lot of litigation and private parties. Um, in the United States, you can sue um, on a competition policy violation. Anyone in the country can bring a lawsuit and the judge can hear it. Um, it's primarily judge, uh, the main competition laws were the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act. They came out of that earlier period I showed you. What I'm gonna take you through in this part, um, and this is the bulk of the competition policy and practice, is six competition policy rules and practices. Um, these are all the mainstream economic view of the issue. These are all the mainstream legal view of the issue. Um, a number of these are debated and are hotly debated issues. So I'm giving you where there is a decently broad agreement but it's not um, universal and it's definitely contested. Um, the first is that monopoly is, and by the way, Chris can make these slides available to you. Monopoly is not illegal. That's a noun. Monopolization is illegal. Monopolization is a verb. So what does that mean? Companies can make very high profits. There's nothing against the law about that. Companies can charge really high prices. That's also not against the law. Companies can be lazy um, and not make any changes or innovation. No one's gone to jail for uh, not innovating. Um, and the rationale is that we think that companies generally grow because they offer a better product or a lower price and that benefits consumers. And we think that if you as a company are charging high prices and making high profits, that's gonna invite entry and competition. 
And so we think the solution to these problems is that some other company is going to come in and stop you. Now, what we worry about, though, is that is monopolization, which is if a company has monopoly power, now what does that mean? Half the market, give or take. Um, we worry that they can't engage in exclusionary and predatory practices. So for example, you can't tell your suppliers they can't sell to competitors, or you can't tell stores you won't get our product if you don't sell a competitor's goods. These rules are only applied to a company with monopoly power. If I want to set up my own Jason Furman, you know, store and I have apples that I grow in my backyard and I go to the supermarket and say, hey, you can only sell my apples. You can't sell anyone else's apples if you sell mine. The supermarket has no problem saying, okay, <laughs> we won't sell your apples, Jason. Um, they're not going to be for sale here. Um, if Apple goes to um, a company and says, you know, if you want to sell iPhones, you can't sell anything else, um, that might make it hard for that company. And so we're more constraining of Apple Corporation's ability to do that than Jason Furman, um, backyard grower of tasty apples. We also don't want you to use monopoly power in one industry to gain it in another. So the Microsoft case 20 years ago was arguing that Microsoft had a monopoly in the Windows operating system and that it was requiring people to use um, the internet browser. So the reason that we worry about these is that they harm consumers and we worry they don't have any benefit to them. And you know, we're not worried about a monopoly if somebody can come in and contest it and compete with it. We're really worried if it uses its monopoly power to keep others out. So if you do these types of things, it might make it impossible for a competitor to come into the market. And that's why um, they're so bad. And as I said, these rules don't apply to me when I sell apples from my backyard. I can do whatever I want, basically. So our worry is really about permanent monopolies. Uh, the most famous monopolization case was Standard Oil um, in 1909 to 1911. It was owned by John D. Rockefeller. Um, it used aggressive tactics like told the railroads you know, you can't ship anyone else's oil if you ship our oil. And when they did that, it made it basically impossible for other oil companies to compete with them. It was broken up into 34 companies. Over the next hundred years, they recombined and now it's only a couple companies, uh, again, like Exxon Mobil, Chevron and Marathon. There have been other cases over the years. Um, American uh, Tobacco, IBM, AT&T, Microsoft. Oh, Digital Giants, sorry, this is outdated. Um, 2020 um, monopolization cases against um, Facebook and Google. So you don't have these cases that often and they're a big, big deal when you do. Sometimes they result in breakup like AT&T. Sometimes like IBM, the government spent over a decade and ultimately dropped the case. Okay. Um, second competition policy rule or practice. And I think this one goes against what a, some people have in their head, which is low prices are not unfair. They're generally good. You know, in mainstream competition, if you accuse a company of having low prices, that's a good thing, um, not a bad thing. So if your criticism of Amazon is their prices are low, that's not a criticism that resonates with most people that work in this area. In fact, they think that's a good aspect of Amazon. Um, now there is something called predatory pricing where you price below cost, you try to drive others out of business and once they're out of business, you take advantage of it and you jack the prices way, way up. This is an idea that a lot of people have in their head. Um, and you worry, you know, the, inter the national chain comes to town, it drives the small businesses, and then it raises the prices. So this is a worry that people have in their head. 
In practice, I've put together a list of all of the well-documented large-scale examples of predatory pricing over the last 100 years in the United States. In my view, there are none. So we have this legend, this idea that this happens. In practice, it's really hard to do. If you lower your prices for a while, maybe you drive someone out, but then you start to raise your prices and they come right back in. Or you lower their prices and you can't lower them for long enough to drive them out of business. Or you drive them out of business and you can't raise your prices. So it is possible that one day Amazon will drive everyone in the country out of business and double all its prices. It is also very, very unlikely. Um, there's a lot of other competitors to Amazon. There could be other competitors that develop. It may be that their distribution network gets so good, their combination of warehouses, um, delivery and the like that they could pull this off. Um, I think that is, is reasonably unlikely. And so you may have concerns about Amazon, but in general, there's a lot more patience for concerns about bad things you're doing to consumers in the present, not you're doing something really good for consumers in the present, and you're worried that it might turn bad in the future. Um, and the legal treatment of predatory pricing, by the way, is companies can charge prices below their cost in order to gain market share. We think that's a good thing for consumers. It makes us happy. Um, they can't do this when there's a high likelihood that they'll successfully become a monopoly, um, but in practice, that's rare. And this rationale is just what I already told you. Low prices are good for consumers. Predatory pricing can, is possible in theory. In practice, it doesn't appear to be very common. Um, okay. Next competition policy rule in practice, which is cartels and collusion are per se illegal. Um, uh, I see. Jason, we do have one question that just came in on predatory pricing. Amy, could you just ask that one? Yeah, I'm Amy Sherman. I work for PolitiFact and I'm based in South Florida. Whenever we have a hurricane coming or it does come, we always hear like um, prosecutors and others warn about predatory pricing. But there it seems to be a little different than the way you spoke about it. It's like the need for certain hurricane related supplies goes way up. So is that truly predatory pricing? Is that illegal? Or if the demand suddenly shoots up, is that allowed? Right, so yeah, so these are two different concepts. One is predatory pricing to drive out competitors and then raise your prices. Another is taking advantage of a disaster. Um, if Bill is on and paying attention, there are some laws and usually the FTC when this happens announces some investigation with some fanfare and a hope to deter it. But most economists usually look at it and think, you know, there's high demand, there's not much supply, this is the law of supply and demand um, going and it's not pleasant, but there's no other way to ration stuff that's pleasant in that circumstance either. Um, so I think there's some ways it can be illegal, but it, it usually isn't. But Bill, you can- Yeah, Jason, uh, most, uh, many state governments have statutes that are called anti-price gouging statutes. And they specify a range of price increases that uh, is illegal in conditions of emergency. Uh, the federal law has limited controls on that. Some of those were put into effect during COVID. Uh, there's a thing called the Defense Production Act that allows the government to impose price ceilings and some emergency conditions. But most of the enforcement of what's called price gouging takes place at the state level. Okay, and just FYI, that is uh, uh, William Kovacic, who is our next speaker, who is sitting in to hear Jason's talk. Great. Um, and I should disclose that um, uh, my brother and I, on average, know an average amount of the law. And my brother's a federal judge. So you can now solve for how much law I know based on that statement, okay. or else I was just very insulting to him. Um, um, cartels and collusion are per se legal. That basically means you don't need to do all this balancing and proving and working out that, you know, showing someone was harmed. It's just automatically, if you do this, the chances that it's good for the world are really low 
the chances that it's bad for the world are really high. So you just need to show that it happened. You don't even really need to, you know, add up all the costs and benefits of it. Um, so companies can't fix prices. They can't make a deal to limit quantities and they can't divide up markets and say, hey, you sell in this area, I'll sell in that area and we won't um, compete with it. Um, people go to jail for um, about 30 people a year and there's pretty large fines for this as well. Um, obviously this is something countries can do. So OPEC has um, a cartel on oil and we can't put countries in jail. They're not subject to US law. The logic for this is that with a cartel, you get all the bad things from a monopoly, um, higher prices and lower quantities, but you don't get any of the good things that you'd get from a monopoly, like the efficiency associated with a single firm that can take advantage of its scale. And so it's sort of all bad and no good. Um, this is a great uh, movie. I think it's probably the best movie on illegal price fixing ever. And I don't just say that because it was starring my college roommate. Um, the, uh, and it was about the conspiracy of Archer Daniels Midland and four other companies to fix prices for lysine. Um, in this case, they had an informant who wore a wire. And so um, it was a landmark prosecution by DOJ with just really clear evidence of people saying, you know, you're going to produce this amount or not lower the price by that amount, et cetera. Um, we've seen this in labor markets too. Um, this is um, uh, a set of emails um, in the Silicon Valley case. Um, please add Google to your hands off list. We recently agreed not to recruit from each other. Um, this one, Eric Schmidt, I think he was the CEO of Google then. Um, he's the executive chairman, anyway, something like that now, um, who had the really bright idea to write down in an email. Um, I would prefer that Omid do it verbally because I don't want to create a paper trail over which we can sue later. Um, he did get sued later. He got sued in part um, with evidence based on emails like that. And um, they were accused of making secret deals not to hire each other's engineers. Um, you've also seen successful collusion cases on um, hospitals in uh, lowering prices of nurses by agreeing to not compete with each other. So that's illegal. Okay, next one. This is another one that's really important and goes a little bit against what I think a lot of people have in their popular conception, which is that in economics and I, in the law, we think very differently about organic growth versus growth by merger. Organic growth, we think chances are, it's not always gonna be the case, but chances are the reason that your company grew is that it made a good product that people wanted to buy at a good price. And we don't wanna get in the way of that. If you're growing because of a merger, we're nervous. Maybe that's good because the merger creates something that has great returns to scale and internal synergies, but maybe that merger really just happened in order to take advantage of consumers to raise prices and restrict quantities. So what would be an example? Um, Walmart is a great example of organic growth. Um, orga Walmart sales grew massively over the last um, 60 years, uh, have grown massively over the last 60 years. And it didn't grow because Walmart bought all the stores in the country. Walmart opened stores all over the country. Walmart stores have done well because people like shopping in them and because they have low prices. And there's nothing illegal about going up this. Um, Walmart also has a lot of competitors. You, there's many places you can buy things. You don't have to buy all your stuff at Walmart. In fact, you don't have to buy anything um, at Walmart and I almost never do. So, um, but even if it was, we're not that worried about it. Um, what we are worried about is that there are four nationwide, there were four nationwide wireless companies, AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, and Verizon. When AT&T and T-Mobile tried to merge together, the government said 
filed a lawsuit. Um, this is back in 2011. Filed a lawsuit because they said, um, and it's worth reading this, um, that it would result in tens of millions of customers facing higher prices, fewer choices, and lower quality prices. So you see, that's the consumer welfare standard. If AT&T just grew, we wouldn't be worried. We'd think that was because people liked AT&T. If AT&T buys something else and grows that way, we get nervous that maybe they're gonna raise prices and reduce choices and it'll be bad for consumers. And so the government um, blocked that merger and the two companies um, decided they weren't gonna be able to prevail and they um, dropped it. Um, it doesn't always stop uh, mergers. Uh, T-Mobile Sprint was another merger. This was of the number, I believe three and number four of the, those four wireless companies. And in this case, um, I should have had the date here, but this is, anyway, this is under the Trump administration. Um, the Justice Department approved the merger of T-Mobile and Sprint. Um, critics were worried that it would reduce competition by lowering the number of wireless um, carriers. And those critics brought a lawsuit. Um, these cases aren't obvious. You know, when a company grows organically, it's almost always gonna be the case, the pros outweigh the cons. When you have a merger in a market like this, there are gonna be pros. You get all sorts of great synergies and there are gonna be cons. You get higher prices and less variety. And it can be a tricky thing and a much debated thing, um, you know, how, how, to, how to weigh them. Um, most of my friends in the antitrust community and the people I sympathize with most are, were in this critics category here, but it's not, you know, without going through all the details, and I never went through all the details, it's hard to know. Okay, um, so just to summarize, um, companies can grow organically. Companies cannot merge with another company if the effect may be to substantially to lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. That's what the Clayton Act says. And um, DOJ and the FTC weigh these two considerations on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, they have some rules for them, um, but ultimately it's gonna be the courts that decide. So the FTC or DOJ, if they want a merger not to happen, they have to sue in court. Sometimes the companies will say, okay, we give up. It's not worth it. And they just drop the merger. Sometimes they go to court um, and fight it out and you never know who wins. Um, and that's important because Bill will talk to you about the trend towards people wanting much more vigorous enforcement. Even if the Obama administration had bought 10 times as many cases as it did, um, there's a decent chance it would have lost a lot of those cases um, in the courts, because ultimately they decide. Um, there's also a whole intermediate ground, which is improved mergers with conditions, where, for example, uh, you require one of the parties to sell some of its business units or promise certain conduct. And there's a certain amount of controversy over those, because especially on the promising certain conduct, does the FTC or DOJ really pay much attention after the merger to whether those conduct rules were followed? and how long do they pay attention for? I'm just continuing through. Horizontal mergers raise more concerns than vertical ones. Horizontal merger, if GM tried to buy Ford, um, that would be a horizontal merger. We don't think there's a whole lot of synergies between them, there's some, but not a whole lot. And so we worry that's gonna be more about raising prices. A vertical merger, if GM tried to acquire Goodyear, or an auto dealer um, that are part of the same supply chain. Um, in general, the thought is a vertical merger is a little bit more likely to just uh, take advantage of, um, of those synergies. So in practice, merge, you can uh, vertically merge in almost all cases. Um, there's a certain amount of debate over whether the law has been too permissive about that. Um, you can't merge horizontally if it substantially lessens competition. And the rationale, again, is vertical mergers likely have some efficiencies, horizontal mergers 
uh, raise more of the balance of concerns. Finally, and Bill will, I think, have a lot to say about this, um, and this is probably the biggest flashpoint of debate right now, uh, antitrust should not try to achieve broader social goals. So, and I'm not, by the way, I'm describing a broad agreement here, not uh, a universal one and not necessarily endorsing every view. But I think for longstanding, both economics and law has been a sense that you shouldn't achieve broader goals. So for example, there's two tobacco companies merging. The goal of, I think it's the FTC that would do that, but maybe it's the DOJ, I can't keep track who, who gets to divide what. Um, their goal is not about health. Their goal is about prices. And so if that merger is gonna raise prices, that's a problem. Um, if that merger is gonna cut prices, that's a good thing. And then there's a completely different thing about health. Um, if you care about health, you wanna raise tobacco taxes or limit marketing or something, but that's not DOJ's antitrust's job or the FTC competition enforcer's job. When I was in the White House, AT&T and T-Mobile came to me and said they were gonna add lots of jobs if the merger went through and Obama wanted jobs so we should allow the merger to go through. I told them that first of all, no one in the White House had anything to do with approving or not approving of the merger. So they shouldn't even talk to me about this. And then I didn't tell them this, but jobs actually shouldn't be the goal of antitrust enforcement. Might be that uh, it's more efficient to have fewer jobs. Um, if a company wants to, without a merger, have a new innovation that cuts jobs, lowers prices, improves quality, we would never make that illegal. Um, we wouldn't take that into account. If you want jobs, there's a lot of things you should do. Maybe put more money into infrastructure or create a tax credit for adding jobs or have a regulatory or tax reform or whatever. Um, it's not the antitrust jobs. Um, you know, American Airlines and US Airways. Um, you hear the argument that um, you know, big business is bad for um, democracy. Um, I can tell you when I sat in the White House, some of the most powerful lobbyists were not big business. Um, when we did the Dodd-Frank Wall Street reform, the auto dealers were more powerful than any banks. They were more powerful because there is an auto dealer in every congressional district in the United States. They are a pillar of the community. And as a result, they got themselves written out of Dodd-Frank entirely. The community banks are very powerful. The hedge funds and private equity firms, they have a tax break called carried interest. They've used their lobbying really well to protect that. So I don't personally think it's obvious to me that the cloud of the airlines is any bigger if you have five airlines or four airlines or three airlines. They're gonna have a decent amount of clout, by the way, no matter how many airlines you have. Um, it, clout to me doesn't change that much. And so I don't think democracy is that important a uh, consideration. I think democracy is a really important consideration in campaign finance reform and access to government and all sorts of things, but um, I've never observed a correlation between you know, industrial concentration and ability to influence the government. Um, definitely wealth creates power. Uh, I'm not denying that at all. In fact, I strongly agree with that, but that's not quite the same. You know, if you had six airlines, they're all gonna be big companies. They're all gonna have a lot of access to the legislative process. They're not gonna be any more influential if there are four companies instead of six. Um, finally, um, privacy, human rights, local media diversity. Uh, those are all really important issues. Um, the general view is, again, you want to use other tools. You don't want to use um, these tools to solve them because it just isn't something that the antitrust enforcers are very good at doing um, and they have enough on their plate already. Um, Jason, we have a couple questions on the same line. Um, Emily, could you maybe ask that one that you have? And Caitlin, I was asking the same question. Yep. Hi, Jason. I'm Lee Wilkins with Bloomberg Government. Um, I know that there is actually a bipartisan effort in Congress right now to look into potential antitrust legislation. I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about that, like what 
possible regulations might be needed in this space and, and how likely do you think it is to that, that Congress actually get something done here? Yeah, so you're gonna hear a lot about that in the next session. I'll just say some of that falls within this paradigm, even within everything I just said, you could have more funding for DOJ or less funding for DOJ. That's one of the issues in the legislation. Um, in some cases, there are issues about these presumptions. There's a real gray area in these mergers and they want to move more of the gray area into the mergers not allowed rather than more of the gray area into the merger is allowed. Like if you can't quite tell if a merger is good or bad, does that mean you definitely block it because you're not sure or you definitely allow it because you're not sure? Right now, if you're not sure, it's more like you allow it. They want to have more cases where if you're not sure, you block it. So I would describe a lot of the legislation as within this paradigm I've been describing, putting the dial in a different place. Um, but then some of them go outside the paradigm and would explicitly say antitrust should be concerned with more than just consumers, but you know, promoting democracy or you know, other goals like that. But you'll hear more granularity next. Okay, and a question from Matt Brown. Hey, Jason, Matt Brown, USA Today. So um, my question is just on natural monopolies. And I think kind of going back to the beginning when we talked about monopolies themselves aren't bad, but um, monopolization is bad. So I've just, I guess I've just been through your, your conversation thinking about if a industry is just naturally tends towards monopolies, like is that a common thing in markets? And if that is a common thing, how does antitrust policy approach that? And then as journalists who are very concerned about how power actually accumulates and just being skeptical and thinking about investigations that we might do, is that how do, how do you approach something where the economics of it just might tend towards there just being one or two industries? Or is that even something we should be worrying about? Yeah, so um, natural monopolies, there's actually a part of my class where I do that. I cut it out for all of you because my class is longer than this one. Um, but, you know, there's a few choices there. Um, if it's you, water, maybe the city owns it. My city, Cambridge, um, the city owns the water company. Uh, you can regulate the prices. That's my electricity prices in Massachusetts are set by the government. The power company doesn't get to choose how much it wants to charge me for electricity because it's the only power company they could charge me um, a lot. So often natural monopolies are dealt with through public ownership or through regulation. Now, some people argue, you know, Facebook's like a natural monopoly because there can only be one social network. Um, and, you know, if that's the case, you know, um, in some ways it's not a problem for antitrust because you're allowed to be a monopoly. You're just not allowed to monopolize. On the second with power, I think my only advice, I mean, I don't have any advice on it. I rely on all of you and your journalism to, to uncover power, although I used to get to see some of it more directly. And, um, and yeah, I think I just wouldn't confuse the issue of wealth being powerful and a monopoly being powerful. And those are two different things. Um, you know, if, um, yeah, I mean, I gave you the example of the auto dealers. Um, in some ways, the auto dealers would be less powerful if there was a single auto dealer company and it was based in Minnesota. If it, that was the case and all the cars were sold by this company based in Minnesota, the Minnesota senators would be obsessed with and constantly advocating for this company and the senators in the other 49 states wouldn't really care about it. Instead, we have auto dealers in all 50 states, and so you have 100 senators that are advocating for auto dealers. So power works in strange ways. Sometimes distributing it um, can be more powerful. I've also dealt with the uh, come up against the retirement um, uh, retirement saving industry, which often tries to rip people off in different ways. And you know is also politically powerful because a lot of it is spread out across the country. So um, yeah, so I just wouldn't, so I think there's sometimes a mistake where people say monopoly and power as opposed to wealth and get into these distinctions about how things are distributed and the like. So um, just to review, by the way, um, uh, monopoly is not illegal. You're allowed to be big. 
but you're not allowed to make yourself big in an illegal manner. Um, low prices, uh, we get excited when we see them. We're, when people complain about low prices, um, economists get annoyed. Uh, that's the whole point of capitalism. Um, cartels and collusion, that's a bad thing. Um, and we're seeing some of that in uh, labor markets. Um, organic growth is generally viewed favorably. Uh, growth by merger is not. Um, horizontal mergers raise more concerns than vertical and antitrust. And this one, as I said, is controversial now, should not try to achieve broader social goals. Um, again, that's not saying you shouldn't achieve those goals. It's just saying someone else should do it other than the antitrust authority. Um, yeah, Nick, Nick raises a good point. A number of the monopolies we have um, in our economy are there actually because of the government. Um, the Jones Act requires um, US companies to do shipping and that makes, um, reduces competition. Foreign airlines can't fly domestic US routes. I can't, British Airways can't open up a flight between Boston and Washington to compete with the airlines that currently do it like US Airways and JetBlue. And so in a number of places in our economy, the obstacle to competition isn't the evil businesses, it's the government. Now, the government might be an obstacle to competition because the evil businesses have convinced the government um, to be an obstacle to competition. So I'm not saying there aren't any businesses involved, but there's a lot of places where there's different rules and regulations and protections that actually help there be more monopolies. And you know, some of those sound good. They're helping American companies. You look harder at them, you know, they're helping the shareholders of American companies have higher prices and, and hurting American consumers. Um, Rebecca um, asks about whether it's more challenging for enforcement after mergers have been approved. Yes, um, it's very hard to go back and put the toothpaste back in the tube. Sometimes the companies are so merged and in general, um, there are, I don't know if it's few or any, um, examples of going back and saying, oh, we allowed this merger, but now we're going to break them up. Well, I guess every time the company was broken up, in effect, some of the mergers had been allowed, but there's not a lot of examples. But that's what uh, the government's trying to do with Facebook now. They didn't challenge Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp and of um, Instagram, and now they're trying to sort of a decade later say, oops, we probably should have challenged it. Uh, they have to get rid of them and break them up now. Jason, just a heads up on time. Um, it's 11.45. We can, we can go to like 12.05 on this, a few minutes extra. So with, uh, I guess, just keep that in mind with how much of your presentation you have. And, okay, uh, perfect. So we want to get as much in as possible. Uh, this is about to be the end of topic one, which is the longest topic. Um, current debate on competition policy, you're going to get a whole hour on this. But I think of it as the Chicago school. I think Bill calls these the traditionalists. Um, and, you know, they believe in the consumer welfare standard. And also, I would argue, believe that usually things are okay. And so the government shouldn't do that much. Otherwise, you'll chill innovation and growth. Um, there's something that I think Bill and I both called the progressive school. It's still pretty technocratic. It still believes in the consumer welfare standard, but it thinks that if you correctly apply economics, more of the mergers we used to allow shouldn't be allowed. And so it turns the dial towards more enforcement, blocking more mergers, breaking more things up, but it still uses the same type of technical economic analysis. Um, I should say this is where you know, my sympathies broadly lie. Um, and then there's the neo-Brandeisians. Um, and uh, Brandeis, uh, uh, eventually Supreme Court Justice, um, had the idea that basically big was bad. You didn't need to prove it was bad. You didn't need to show the bad things it did. It was just sort of presumptively bad. And um, the neo-Brandeisians have a lot of, have been very successful in the public debate of shifting towards that notion and towards the idea that antitrust should pursue broader goals. Um, I think there's some good arguments for that. I think a lot of it hasn't you know, fully thought through all the issues I've talked about 
and so um, uh, wanted to wanted to emphasize that. Okay. Um, next topic, and it's going to use some of the ideas that we were just talking about, is the increase in concentration. Start with an example. I think all of you know Budweiser and Heineken. Some of you may know Joe, Goose, Elysian, Lagunitas, Maximas, Sibel, Ruby, you know, all these other beers. Um, they look all really exotic and boutique and niche, um, except all the ones on the left are actually made by Anheuser-Busch InBev, and all of the ones on the right are made by Heineken. Either they put other labels on beers they invented, or more often they bought some small company that made this. And so I think about 80%, I might have this number wrong, of beer is made by these two companies. This is pretty emblematic of what's going on throughout our economy. Um, don't read these, but just everywhere, agriculture, appliances, beer, fertilizer, you go to the supermarket, there's lots of different types of mayonnaise. I think those are basically two companies. Lots of different types of cat food. I think those are you know, two companies making those cat food. Um, so throughout our economy, there are in lots and lots of areas, fewer and fewer firms. And this is the market share of the top two firms in a lot of industries. And you see in most industries, the top two firms have increased market share. Um, only in a few areas have the top two firms decreased their um, market share. So notice I'm calling this concentration. Concentration is a neutral word. It's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, it's a fact. Um, increased concentration though, and again, this is such an important idea, and I think it's missed out quite a lot, is it could mean one of two things. It could actually mean more competition. You, know, you have one small business in every town in America. That small business, I'm making this up, pays really low wages. It's a terrible place to work. There's no opportunities for advancement. The boss um, you know, routinely che cheats people on their hours. They charge high prices and have a bad selection. But you look and there's 5,000 companies in America. Now, Walmart, Target, and you know, a national supermarket chain come into town and all 5,000 of those companies go out of business. And now instead of 5,000 companies, you have just three companies. But with those three companies, you may have actually more competition uh, in a way that benefits both consumers and workers. But increased concentration could also mean um, less competition. You are able to monopolize an industry. You're able to take advantage of a regulation. You're able to do something that makes it so that others can't um, come in. And concentration can happen for good reasons, like superstar firms or globalization, happen for bad reasons. Um, there has been a reduction in merger and antitrust enforcement, and there have been increased regulatory barriers to entry. You know, we used to challenge more mergers and courts used to allow them to be blocked. And so that's one reason there's increased concentration. Um, some like natural causes cut both ways. So um, this is just the number of cases fired, filed by the Department of Justice under section two of the Sherman Act. This is the FTC enforcement rate against mergers from six to five significant competitors. Um, these things have gone down over time. That might be good, that might be bad, but I think it's fair to say there's less enforcement today than there used to be. There's also more regulations and more intellectual property rules. Some of the biggest monopolies in our country are you know, drugs and movies, for example, uh, where the government says you have intellectual property in them, uh, maybe for good reason, maybe for bad reason. 
My own view is that whether it's good or bad competition depends a lot on the sector. And a good illustration of this is retail and healthcare. In both retail, think Walmart, and healthcare, think your local hospital, there's been a big increase in concentration. But that concentration has done very different things. In the retail sector, markups, that's how much you're marking up your price over your cost, have actually gone down. You know, consumers have gotten lower prices as retail has grown more concentrated. Efficiency measured by the output per hour in the sector has gone up enormously. Hospital mergers, which I should say um, I'm not a fan of, I think there've been too many. Uh, again, people can debate that. Um, something very different. When you see a healthcare merger, you tend to see prices go up. You know, it's the markup over cost. And you don't see a lot of efficiency gains when hospitals merge. And so what the concentration growth, somewhere in the economy, it's good for consumers. In some places in the economy, it's been bad for consumers. And just to continue to, um, to sort of beat on the hospitals, and again, this is debated, different people have different views, um, but this is one paper from a leading economics journal looked at um, all of the hospital mergers and found if you looked at an area with um, a monopoly, its prices after lots and lots of careful adjustments were 12% higher than a place with four or more hospitals. A place with only two hospitals, its prices were 7% higher. And a case with three hospitals, its prices, a place with three hospitals, its prices were 4% higher. And so it seems like hospital mergers is an example of where you just haven't got big efficiencies. It has enabled you to raise prices. What about Google, Facebook, and Amazon? Are they like Walmart, which has grown because consumers like it and they organically grew? There's nothing to be concerned about. Or are they like the hospitals, which have you know, grown through mergers, raising prices, and don't have um, a lot of efficiencies? In reality, they're probably some complicated combination of both good and bad reasons for their growth. And the trick for policymakers is to stop the bad ones while not getting in the way and interfering with the good ones. Some people think that can be done, um, others can't. And so the last part of my discussion is going to be just a quick introduction to the issue of the digital giants themselves. So um, the digital giants are new faces for old cartoons. Those are the new titans, they're not oil and steel. Uh, they're Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, in that case. Um, Amazon is the new octopus. You do see higher rising market shares in most digital markets. Didn't need to show you this chart to know that. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna skip over some of these. Um, there's a lot of features that make these markets winners take most. Network externalities. Um, if you eat my, the apples that I make, you don't really care whether or not other people are eating the apples. If you use a social network, you really wanna use a social network that other people are using. So that's what a network externality is. You benefit from a product if more people are using it. Economies of scale or scope. It doesn't cost very much to add an extra person to Facebook. You know, all near zero marginal costs. Data is a barrier to entry. Google has tons and tons of data. You wanna set up a search engine, it's gonna be hard for you to set up a very good one. Even if you have the cleverest algorithm in the world without access to Google's data, you're just not gonna be as good as their search engine. Um, they have a lot of capital and brand names. Um, and there's behavioral features, consumers don't seem to switch. None of these five are unique to digital markets but they're all present and present in very severe forms in digital markets. And so that gives rise to this winner take most dynamic. 
even with this tipping, a big question is there's probably not competition in the market. There's not a lot of choices, but is there competition for the market? This is one of the big debates. MySpace wasn't so good, and so Facebook was able to take over. If Facebook is not very good, does that mean another company will come in and replace Facebook? If you think there's competition for the market, then you're not very worried about Facebook. On the other hand, if you think that Facebook is gonna figure out how to squash every competitor before it comes in, maybe buy them, freeze them out in some way, do what John D. Rockefeller did to his competitors, um, then you're worried and you think it won't take care of itself and the government uh, needs to be involved. So I wanna address the question of whether the lack of competition is costly. Most of what these companies does is free or a lot of what these companies does is free. Um, should we be concerned? I think there's still reason to be concerned even if things are free. Um, zero is just another number. Maybe uh, Facebook should have paid me to use it for the opportunity to access me and the valuable advertising money they get because they have me. Um, maybe, um, you know, when I see advertisements on Facebook, the products are now charging me more money. You know, the government, when they drive up steel prices with tariffs, I never in my life have bought cold rolled steel, but I still pay more money because of steel tariffs because I buy things that are made out of steel. Well, I also buy things that are made out of advertising and maybe those are more expensive. I'm paying in my data and my privacy. I might be paying in lost quality and variety because there's not competition and lost innovation as well. Mobile phones, we benefit that Apple and um, Google com compete, Apple and Android compete on privacy. There's only one company, maybe there wouldn't be any privacy brand. So I think there are costs to it as well. Um, also notably, it's not just organic growth in the digital sector. Google is Google today because it bought all of these companies. Some cases they were aqua hires, they were just hiring the people of the company, but in some cases they were buying the technology or even buying the market. Facebook wouldn't be Facebook if it hadn't bought these companies. So these aren't pure Walmart just growing organically. So I'll end on um, these different approaches on the digital giant, sorry. One is do nothing and just let potential competition solve it. If Facebook is really so bad, someone else will come in. Another is to use standard antitrust tools, stop some future mergers, bring some cases and the like. And we've started to do more of that. A third is to regulate for competition. Um, this is something that a report that I chaired for the UK government recommended and they're doing. They're establishing something called the Digital Markets Unit, which is a regulator that's gonna require um, different forms of competition. Uh, the European Commission is doing this too. Um, and then finally, and maybe I should have put this under two because in some ways it is a standard antitrust tool. Um, you could break the companies um, up. This is where the current debate is. And it's going on all around the world um, in the United States, in Europe, in Australia, et cetera. So I think we only have about three more minutes left for any questions that we haven't gotten to over the course of this. I think uh, Rachana had a, you had a healthcare question. Was that ans answered by his later talk or you still have one there? I do, uh, Jason answered it a little bit. I was going to ask you, uh, you said you're not a huge fan of hospital mergers, but I was, I guess, so you made that clear, but I'm just wondering if you could speak generally about antitrust enforcement with respect to hospital mergers um, over time, like how strong or weak is it in your opinion? Yeah, I think it's been relatively weak. I think a lot of the weakness is, is in the courts. You know, even where the FTC has sued to block a merger, the courts hear from the hospital and the hospital people sound like they care about your health and they're very compelling. And so who do you trust? Like somebody running a bunch of numbers or somebody who like wants to make you healthier. Um, I, that's a maybe overly cynical interpretation. So, you know, I think the trickier question is what to do about it. Um, it's, it's not like you can 
I mean, somebody asked if you can undo a merger. You know, maybe you can, but hospital mergers, there's a thousand of them. I'm quite confident we can't undo a thousand mergers. Um, many hospital mergers are individually small. It's just they collectively add up to a lot. So it might be that the answer here is some form of price regulation or something like that, maybe using Medicare to more aggressively um, regulate prices and that we can't deal with this through the antitrust system anymore. Um, in terms of other parts of healthcare, other than hospitals, um, you know, there's things like physicians, offices, uh, you know, there used to be solo practitioner, then they all became offices, then the offices all became affiliated with hospitals. Some of those were because of government policy. You get more from Medicare if your physician's office is part of a hospital and gets reimbursed that way than if it's standalone. So maybe we need to change the way Medicare does its reimbursements. We have a question from Alex on media um, concentration. Alex, could you maybe ask that question? And that'll probably be need to be the last one of the session. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate the presentation. Um, so I, I'm curious about your thoughts on um, media concentration uh, since the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, as I said, I, I used to be a technical producer for um, iHeartMedia. Um, and essentially, from how I understood the, how they evolved, uh, they bought up community radio stations across the country, and then they've played largely um, syndicated conservative news talk radio and replaced kind of that local voice um, in the communities. And kind of given how uh, the uh, hyper polarized kind of political environment we've we find ourselves in today, um, do you think that had a, any impact on, I, I guess, our society's ability to come to any loose uh, understanding of the of objective reality, uh, for lack of a better term? I don't, I'm tortured by this. I, I'm not a fan, as you might imagine, of uh, Michael Savage, Glenn Black, uh, Sean Hannity, et cetera. I don't know who the et was, but my guess is I'm not a fan of them either. Um, not a fan would be an understatement of my views about all of them, um, but I certainly don't believe in censorship. Part of why they've been successful is there's a lot of people in the country that like to listen to them. Um, I have no problem. I get more information from more places than I ever have um, in my life. Um, you know, Twitter is like, uh, gives you access to huge, huge, huge numbers of things. Um, a lot of that the industry doesn't get paid for and it's free content. And that's a big problem too. How are you gonna continue to generate content? But it's hard for me with a straight face to say I can't get things. Now, in terms of local news, um, there is less local news. I think that's a problem. There's a number of efforts to combat it. Um, I don't know how much of that is also about demand for local news uh, and how much people actually want to read it. Like I, I've nationally oriented, that's what I've worked in. Um, I just, you know, I have a subscription to the Boston Globe. It's a fantastic newspaper. I read it way less than I read the Washington Post or the Financial Times. Uh, I'm obviously not your average person in regard to the interests I have, but I don't know, I'm tormented. So I, I sort of hate this, but I don't have any great reason to think there should be a fairness doctrine when there's so many different ways to reach people. Thank you. Okay, and with that, I think we need to draw this session to a close. Uh, Jason, I wanna thank you very much for the, for the great presentation and the great Q&A time that you were able to give us all. Thank you very much for giving us, giving us your time and your great insights. Thank you.